Okay, so today we are going to talk about operational amplifiers or op amps in the differentiate, differentiator configuration. So a differentiator circuit using an op amp. Now, if you remember your calculus, this shouldn't be too surprising, but a differentiator is simply something that measures the rate of change of something. And that's all this circuit does is it takes the input and the output shows the change on the input. So if you have a constant on the input, then your output is going to be zero. If you have something that's uh, changing in a constant way on the input, then your output is going to be a constant. And if you have something that is on constantly changing, you're going to have a constantly changing output. Again, you can just take the input, differentiate it, and that is your output. So let's go over the circuit really quick, go over the math to show how that relationship both is mathematically and also how we get it. And then I have a simple circuit here to show some of these concepts in real life. And I think it's pretty interesting. I like differentiation for some reason, but everybody has their uh, um, own things. So whatever, let's get into this. So a differentiator is basically where you take the non-inverting output, tie it to ground, and then the inverting output is connected to Vn with a capacitor, and then you have just a resistor on that feedback loop from V out. So I left off the F for resistor and all that sort of stuff, just to keep the, keep the math a little bit easier, but that is it. You have your feedback resistor and your capacitor. Now, if you remember from circuits, uh, your capacitor blocks anything that's DC, and passes um, higher frequencies of AC. And the relationship between current through a capacitor is not via Ohm's law, but from the equation C times dV dt, or it's the capacitance times the change in voltage over the change in time, which will give you the actual current through there, which is going to be very important as we break through all this. But I, as I mentioned, the output is simply the derivative of the input, and then it is actually just the multiplied by negative RC. So in this case, the output is also inverted. With that, let's just quickly derive this formula and show where it comes from here, and then we'll jump into the practical, practical example. So as always, we know that these two points are the same voltage because of the out driving that. So you have on this inverting out, excuse me, inverting input, a virtual ground that you can assume that that is zero volts. And then we also know that no current is going into either of those inputs. And with that, we can assume that our current going this way is the same as our current going that way. So we just do our very simple relationship where we can say the current through here is the voltage difference from V in to ground times the, uh, excuse me, the change in the voltage difference between V in and ground times C. So we get this current I, I equals, uh, there we go, C, D, and then we can change that to V in minus zero because it's that voltage difference over DT. And of course that zero is going to just go away and then we know that this current is simply going to be Ohm's law, very straightforward. So that is going to be zero volts minus V out over our resistance, R. Okay, and that is our equation. Now we're just gonna need to clean it up to make it look like that. So again, getting rid of that zero and getting rid of that zero, and then we want V out to be on its own. All we have to do is multiply both sides by R, so we can bring the R over here and then multiply both sides by negative one to get rid of this negative V out. So that, we get that negative over here, and then we get that R, and then we still have that C, and then we have D V in over D T equals V out. So an extremely, extremely simple um, calculation here on figuring out how that relationship between V in and V out is. I think the most challenging part for this might be for those people that are still learning basic circuits to remember that current through a capacitor is simply C dV dt. And if you know that, then this is extremely straightforward and everything falls into place quite nicely. So that's the circuit setup, the output equation, and exactly how we get to that, that very simple derivation. 
So let's jump onto the practical example where we'll talk about some of the expectations you'll see in the performance, some of the drawbacks, uh, and I'd actually like to compare it to an integrator circuit because you'll notice a couple of features that some things that we struggled with the integrator, we don't struggle with with our uh, differentiator, but some of the things that we struggle with the differentiator don't really affect an integrator circuit, which makes sense because they're going in opposite directions. But let's get this pulled over here and set up really quick, and we'll jump right into that. Okay, so once again, we have this breadboard here, and uh, it's something I was thinking about, that this may look overly complicated. There are a lot of things connected to this, and uh, the vast majority of that is simply just connecting the oscilloscope and the, uh, the waveform generator and the power supply and all that sort of stuff. When you actually are using this in a real circuit, this is, can be way simpler because you're not going to have all of this stuff connected to it in a normal circuit. So I just wanted to point that out before I get into this just because I realize that people might be looking at this thinking, why is this so complicated? And a lot of it is simply the measurement aspects. So like normal, we have our power, it's positive 10 volts, and our uh, negative VEE, I think is what it's called. It's right here, so that's our negative 10 volts. We have tied our non-inverting output to ground, which is at zero volts. And then this is our input from the arbitrary waveform generator, and then this is the oscilloscope so that we can do a direct comparison of the um, both the input and the output. And it is connected to this capacitor that is going into the inverting output. And then the output is connected back to that inverting output via this resistor. Okay, so that's, that's really it. Let's jump into the waveforms themselves. Okay, so here on the oscilloscope, we have our yellow, which is our input, and we have our blue, which is our output. So as you notice, this is just a simple square wave, and so it is dropping to a basically negative 2.5 volts here, and then it jumps up to positive 2.5 volts. And every time it changes, you get a spike in the opposite direction, remember, because there's that negative RC value. And you'll notice that it takes a little while here before it jumps back up to zero. So there is a bit of a responsiveness, not issue, but something you need to take into account and you can size your resistor and your, cap your capacitor with that to make it so that that is a longer or shorter response. But uh, this is just a great example because again, every time it drops down, your output spikes up and then there's no change in the input. So the output changes to zero again. And every time you do that. So this is exactly what you would expect for a square wave with your input being a square wave and your output looking like some sort of weird modified square wave, but not exactly. And again, in a perfect world where you size this just right, those would be just almost instantaneous spikes where it spikes down and then immediately goes back. But we're seeing a little bit of time delay in there. So let's change this to a ramp input. And now this is interesting because our ramp input shows you're constantly changing, you're constantly getting higher, you're constantly getting lower, you're constantly getting higher, and just like that. So our output, just as we'd expect, is the inverse. As this has a negative downward trend, we are seeing a positive voltage on the output. And then as it's becoming positive, again, because of the negative RC factor, our output is negative. So the differential of a ramp uh, wave is a square wave. And this is more of a true square wave. You get some squiggles, uh, in the corners, as you'd expect from any sort of uh, imperfect device. So again, if this were perfect, that would be a perfect square wave on the output. Now we know that the different, uh, the derivative of a sine wave is a cosine, and so let's do a sine wave and see what it looks like. There we go. Again, you can see that they are both sine waves because they're constantly changing and they're just out of phase, with the yellow being the input and then the blue being the output. And so that's nice, nice pretty wave, and it, it looks great. So it, that is exactly what we'd expect from all of these. Again, I don't know if I'm saying this too many times, but remember that it is the negative derivative. So it will be flipped from what you would be expecting if you're just thinking of a simple derivative. Now, one of the things I want to point out is I'm going to shift this input, um, give it a DC offset. So and it might mess with my triggering. So if it goes wild for a second, I apologize. But let's cause our input to go up. 
Now you can see the yellow line going up. What, what are you noticing about the blue? And see, I'm messing with the triggering. Even though the input is going up, the blue, the output, is staying the same. And that's because it's a DC offset. So you, you know, just if you take the derivative of any equation, you're going to get rid of any constant. And it's the same thing here, that as you change that DC offset, it's not going to affect your output in the slightest. So I also want to point out, you notice that the output isn't wandering. It's not going up or down like you do, like we saw with the integrator circuit. And that's because it doesn't matter if we have the DC bias input problem between the two inputs. So again, in reality, the inputs to the op amps aren't at the exact same voltage. And with the integrator circuit, that difference is accentuated and it gets bigger and bigger. Whereas with this, with your differentiator, it doesn't matter if there's a DC offset between the inputs, even a slight one, because it doesn't care about that DC input. So that's quite, that's quite nice. Now, granted, there are still some things that you can do to make this more usable in a real life application. This is definitely more of a benchtop experimental uh, setup. But one final thing that I do want to say is that unlike the integrator, this is actually more susceptible to a high frequency noise because again, it reacts to a change. So if you have something that spikes it, you will see something on the output. Whereas a really quick blip on an integrator isn't going to change the overall shape of the waveform too much, whereas that will be accentuated in a differentiator circuit. So that is something to take into consideration. But that, that's really it. So conceptually, these are quite simple. They can get more complicated as you are using them in real life and trying to make up for the lack of perfection in op amps and lack of perfection in just circuits in general. But they're quite straightforward in their most basic use. And they can be quite useful depending on the application you need. These sort of things were incredibly important back in the days of analog computers. But um, we won't get into that. I do hope this was helpful. If it was, give it a like, subscribe to our channel. If you have any questions, leave them in the comments below and we will catch you in the next one.